Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Since the Council's launch, we've conducted a series of webinars to highlight key issues and support our members in the field in general as they navigate pressing challenges. We're glad you can be here today as we dive into one of the hottest topics of a very busy new summer, policing and racial justice. I'm Abby Walsh, Vice President of Strategy and Operations here at the Council on Criminal Justice. And before we begin our program, a few notes. We will be joined by nearly 350 participants today, including policymakers, the public, and the media. To ensure a quality experience for everyone, all lines will be muted. But we want to hear from you. So throughout today's session, you can submit questions using a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will take as many questions as possible at the end of today's session. Our mission at the Council is to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation and build consensus for solutions that enhance safety and justice for all. The death of George Floyd thrust the challenge of police reform firmly into the spotlight, where it has remained throughout the summer and election season. It's no secret that our country is navigating an intensely polarized era. We've seen it in the presidential debates and in state and local political campaigns, and we see it every day on the streets of our cities. Our goal today is to share what opinion polls can tell us about the public's view on racial justice and police reform. To be clear, we are not advocating any specific approach or policy proposals, but our expert guests will share what they know about public opinion on issues that have become top societal concerns. Now, we all know that public opinion can be tricky to gauge. What the research says doesn't always align with popular perception. And geography, age, race, gender, experience, faith, political affiliation, so many other factors can significantly affect an individual's opinions on key questions. That's why we've invited two leading public opinion researchers to examine some tough questions and attempt to shine a light on the differing opinions shaping discussions of reform and justice today. John Gramlich of the Pew Research Center and Steve Crabtree of Gallup have both studied the public's opinions on criminal justice for many years and have written extensively on their findings. We've asked Wesley Lowry to act as both a moderator and panelist today. Wesley is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author and friend of the council who spent his career examining use of force and calls for racial justice. We hope today's conversation will inform your work and expand your understanding of the landscape. Wesley, feel free to begin. Awesome, Abby, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks a ton to the council for having me here for this, uh, what I think is gonna be a really interesting conversation. You know, I've spent a lot of the last six or so years covering these issues in cities across the country, um, having these conversations. Um, and one of the things I always find most interesting is when additional polling and research comes out about public perception around these issues, uh, because we have a ton of conversation um, and that conversation is often guided by uh, key voices on various sides of the debate, but, but often it's hard to drill into what the public and the public are at large want. Uh, I know we certainly have seen some shifts over the course of, of the years on this. This is, hasn't been a static question and what people believed in 2012, 2013, 2014 was different than perhaps what a lot of people believe today. Uh, but I, I'm really interested to chat with John and Steve about what the polling, what the numbers, what the research tell us about this moment. Because obviously this is an extremely important moment um, and, and we're seeing departments and the industry across the country uh, debate how might we bring policing in line with the public's expectation of it. But in order to do that, we have to understand what the public's expectation of policing is. And so uh, I, I want to start by just kind of turning to John and Steve and, and, and it's starting with just a question about, you know, what are Americans overall opinions about the police in terms of positives, in terms of negatives? How do those things break down by different demographics and groups of people? And, and what might we draw from uh, what the data tells us? Uh, should I start? <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Great. Um, well, thank you guys for having me here. It's always a privilege to be a part of uh, these kinds of high level discussions. And um, I think you're right, Wesley, there's no more important topic um, than this, uh, I mean, this election cycle around the country right now. 
Um, we have done quite a bit of polling at Gallup on uh, uh, perceptions of the police and uh, social justice issues uh, more generally, especially recently um, since the killing of George Floyd. But we've had, we have several trends that we've tracked for a long time, at least 20 years. And um, one of the notable findings this year is that for the first time, uh, the percentage of Americans who say they have a lot or a great deal or quite a lot of confidence in the police has dipped below 50%. So it's now at 48%. Uh, over the 20 years we've been tracking that, it's, it's never been below 50% before. In 2017, it was up at 57%. So there's been some, uh, some decline since then. Um, but more, uh, I think, almost as important or just as important is the fact that um, since 2014, uh, perceptions of the police, uh, confidence in the police, has diverged politically uh, to a, a massive extent, right? So um, in 2014, um, I guess 2013, just prior to the events in Ferguson um, and New York when uh, unarmed black men were killed, there was a nine point partisan difference between Republicans and, and Democrats in confidence in the police. And now that has, those, those trends have diverged and um, there's now a 54% difference. So it's a massive shift. And um, if you look at the trends, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear that um, that divergence started in 2014, you know, after the uh, events, in, particularly after the events in Ferguson. So now Republicans have become much more uh, identified with uh, law and order issues while Democrats have become more identified with social justice issues. And we're, we're very much more polarized on these than, than we ever have been. Yeah, I would follow up and uh, agree with everything Steve said. Um, uh, first, I wanna thank everyone for joining us and for the invitation to speak here on behalf of Pew. Um, I, I, I guess what I would add to what Steve said is that uh, we see in our polling kind of two sides of a coin when we ask about the police, um, general versus specific. So if you ask people overall, what do they think of the police and, and how the police compare with some other groups in society, the police do pretty well. Um, the most recent time we asked about this was just uh, just before the killing of George Floyd in April. We asked um, Americans what they thought about police, um, and 78% uh, of Americans said that they had a great deal or a fair amount of confidence. So that wasn't quite as high as the military or scientists, which are groups that typically do very well in these kinds of questions, uh, but it was still pretty good. It was higher than um, the share of Americans who said that about college professors, about religious leaders, about journalists, about business leaders and bringing up the rear elected officials. Um, my apologies to anyone uh, in the audience who is an elected official or was. Um, similarly, when we ask people on what we call a feeling thermometer, basically something that runs from zero to 100, where 100 is the most positive, warmest possible rating and zero is the most negative, coldest rating. We ask them what they think about the police, what the score is. The mean rating for police the last time we asked was 67. So about two thirds of the way up the scale. Again, not as high as the military or uh, teachers, but above college professors and some other groups we asked about. Um, so when you ask in this kind of general way, the police are seen pretty positively, at least in our surveys in the, in the last couple of years. But um, when you ask about police in a more specific way, looking at specific aspects of their work, it's a much more uh, mixed story. And I think we have a slide um, uh, that shows this, but. Uh, the last time we asked uh, about some more specific aspects of policing uh, was in June, right after the killing of uh, George Floyd. And we asked in that survey how the police are doing on four um, particular questions, protecting people from crime, using the right amount of force in each situation, treating racial and ethnic groups equally, and holding officers accountable for misconduct. Uh, so out of those four things, the only one on which uh, Amer the American public said police are doing a, a good job on balance was number one. Uh, on the other three, about two thirds of the public that the police are doing only a fair or a poor job. So that gives you a sense of this kind of general versus specific um, uh, dynamic that we see. Uh, and then in terms of the question about um, how different groups feel towards the police, um, Steve already mentioned the partisan divide. That is a, a fundamental break in views of the police has been in recent years, um, absolutely. Uh, but we also see other, other uh, differences by race and by age. So typically the groups that are more positive toward, toward police are older Americans, 
white Americans, those who identify as Republican or independents who lean that way, and the groups that are less positive toward police are pretty much the opposite of younger Americans, members of racial or ethnic minority groups, and those who identify as Democrats or lean Democrats. You know, John, uh, looking at those slides, something that was interesting to me was on the, on the previous one, it looked like the lowest grades or the lowest ranks in terms of belief the police were doing a good job. I don't want to misstate the poll language, so I'm glad it's back, right? Uh, but per, the, the percent, it, it, I was looking at these two on the right, right? Treating racial and ethnic groups equally and holding officers accountable when misconduct occurs, right? And, and those look like they're not that far off, I guess, from using the right amount of force in each situation, but they're the lowest marks of this set of questions, right? And so I just wanted to highlight that because in terms of gauging what are some of the pressure points where perhaps there's some of the deepest distrust or skepticism, it looks like that uh, that's what the, the polling is showing. These are some of the areas in terms of accountability, treating racial and ethnic groups equally, and then using the right amount of force when forces um, being applied. I, I wanted to follow up with you to both. You both touched on it, but can we drill in for a second on how perceptions and trust of police vary along racial and ethnic groups? Uh, obviously, that is uh, one of the main public conversations we're having. And also, um, while we do know that we, we are in like a remarkably polarized environment currently, um, with Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives, we also know that race is one of these kind of uh, chief differentiating uh, factors when it comes to how this is polling. And so I just wanted to make sure we underscored that part of it. What does the data tell us about uh, how race shows up? Uh, well, I can address that. We have a, a few questions that we asked uh, for the first time this year um, in the wake of the George Floyd incidents and all the protests that followed. Um, we asked a question about, uh, one of the things we wanted to gauge was people's everyday interactions with the police and were those positive or negative? Um, because I think, you know, in terms of police relations with the community, that's what everybody's sort of focused on right now, how to, how to improve those day-to-day -day, uh, interactions and ensure that, you know, uh, relations are good and violence doesn't occur. So we asked if you had an interaction with police in your area, how confident are you that they would treat you with courtesy and respect? And among all Americans, just 15% said not too confident or not at all confident. But among Black Americans, uh, that goes up to 39%. So about four in 10 Black Americans not confident that they'd be treated with respect. Among white Americans, it's one in 10, about 9%. So a big racial gap there. We see a lot of other racial uh, gaps in terms of questions about interactions with the police. Um, we asked one question about um, thinking about interactions that you may have had with the police over the past 12 months, were they, were they positive overall, negative? 75% uh, of Americans say positive overall. This was just people who had interactions with police. But that number drops to 59% among Black Americans and 79, rises to 79% among white Americans. So again, you get that four in 10 among Black Americans who have a negative impression uh, of the police based on their encounters. And so again, in a lot of ways, that's almost, it's, it's the inverse, it's reversed uh, in, in those numbers, that the majority of Black Americans are saying they believe based on their encounters, they, they have negative perception or relationship with the police. Oh, and white, yeah. yeah. And, and white Americans are, are flipped. Yeah. yeah, much lower. Four in 10. Yeah, yes, 40%. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, and I can um, piggyback on that um, in terms of uh, how, how people see the police treating racial and ethnic minority groups. Obviously, you saw that, that earlier slide about um, around two thirds of Americans um, not giving the police especially high marks on that front. Um, that was a survey from uh, a couple of months back, and we actually just released a new survey yesterday uh, that has uh, new data out, uh, but the story hasn't changed at all in that survey. Um, we found that two thirds of Americans say black people are generally treated less fairly than white people when dealing with the police. So exactly the same number as June, uh, right after the after, uh, right in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing. Uh, and there are huge uh, racial and ethnic differences in, in these views. Um, yesterday's survey found that 91% of black Americans say black people are generally treated less fairly than white people by the police. 
Um, there were much smaller shares of Hispanic and Asian and white Americans who said that. But one thing I would like to point out, which I think is, is notable, um, is that it's still a majority view across all four major racial and ethnic groups. So you had 91% of black Americans saying that, but so did 71% of Hispanic Americans, 71% of Asian Americans. These are uh, English speaking uh, Asian Americans only that we surveyed uh, and 58% of white Americans. Um, so to me, that's pretty notable that this is a majority view. And uh, if, you, if you might think that this is the majority view only very recently, maybe because of this summer's events, that's actually not the case. Uh, we asked the same question uh, in well, a very similar question, I should say, in early 2019, before the George Floyd event uh, incident and the, the events of this year. Uh, and back then, 84% of black people and 63% of white adults also said that black people are treated less fairly by, uh, by the police than white people. So in other words, this has been uh, the majority view across racial and ethnic groups for quite a long time now, even if there are still big differences. Hmm. Now, what can the polling and the research tell us about some of these conversations that we are now having, right? That I think a lot of what we talked about speaks to where the conversation was in 2013, 2014, 2015, right? This debate over whether or not there was disparate treatment, um, whether or not accountability might happen. It seems like those positions are relatively baked in and now we're having new and additional conversations, conversations about things like defunding or divesting or abolishing even, right? Is there polling, is there information that tells us where the public is now on some of these questions about tactic and reform and, and things that might change in policing. And if we know where things are now, is there a trend line at all? You know, have those things changed at all from even where we were three or four or five years ago? Um, I, I can answer that. We, we asked a question um, gauging public support for several proposed uh, policing reforms uh, in the wake of the George Floyd incident. And, um, you know, they kind of divide into three sets. One set is uh, pretty much un uncontroversial among all groups. And those things, those are things that include, as you mentioned, Wesley, um, you know, changing man management practices to hold police more accountable for their actions. Um, we have a kind of a vague item that said requiring offers to ha officers to have good relations with the community. Those things are all things that pretty much everybody agrees should happen, right? So over 95% of all Americans with, you know, I guess, I think over 95% across partisan lines. Um, then there are, there's one that doesn't get much support on any, among any group, which is abolishing police departments altogether. So, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, most Americans, 15% of Americans say they strongly or somewhat, somewhat support that. 27% of Democrats and 1% of Republicans. So not that much, uh, there you go, not, not that much um, support among any group. Um, but then there's a, there's a middle uh, set of uh, proposed policy changes where there are wide partisan divides. And so you have a lot of um, sort of ambivalence among the American public. Um, and it, a, a lot depends on the wording we use to uh, ask the question. So we get a pretty le high level of support for com promoting community-based alternatives such as violence intervention, 82% uh, overall, but significantly lower among Republicans than Democrats, almost all Democrats support that. Um, some of the more controversial items are ending stop and frisk, which is far more likely to be supported by Democrats than Republicans, uh, as is um, eliminating police unions, um, eliminating officer en enforcement of nonviolent crimes. And then the one that most closely uh, corresponds to defunding the police, I think, is um, this one that's next to the last on the bottom, which is reducing the budgets of police departments and shifting the money to social programs. So um, this is where we see the biggest partisan divide of all um, in uh, that just 5% of Republicans say they support this idea versus 78% of Democrats, which is a massive gulf. So it really just depends on which group you're talking to. Um, and that's why you see about half of Americans, 40, 47% overall um, support the idea. And then that number is similar among political independents. You know, what, what is interesting here, even, even just looking at the totals, right? Setting aside the partisan divides yeah. is that I actually think these numbers are much higher than I might have expected for re for reducing budgets and departments, which is 
a stand-in for defund, 47%, eliminating officer enforcement of nonviolent crimes, which is a tactical form of defund in a way, right? It, and, and eliminating police unions has a majority support, uh, which is, uh, like I said, all those things just stand out to me as a little sur surprising um, that I might not have expected to have such broad support, even if it's relatively partisanly polarized. Yeah, right. One thing to note is that Democrats are, in general, as you might expect, more likely to support unions than Republicans. But in the case of police unions, we see more Democrats than Republicans favoring eliminating them. Hmm. That's, that's, really, that's, that's really interesting in terms of the interaction with, our, with the politics. John, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, like Gallup, we've also um, been asking about some of these things, um, and uh, I think we may, we may have a slide looking at some of the policy proposals that we asked about in June. Um, and so I guess I would just echo Steve on the, on the point that there is majority support for most of the things we asked about. Um, we asked about things like requiring police officers to be trained in nonviolent alternatives, creating a federal database to track officers who were accused of misconduct, giving civilian oversight boards the power to investigate and discipline officers, uh, requiring officers to live where they do their policing, uh, making it a crime for police officers to use chokeholds. And uh, we also asked about qualified immunity. Uh, and in most of these cases, uh, a majority of Americans supported, uh, supported each proposal. Um, I think that the, um, one of the slides I, looks at our, our partisan breaks on this, and it's similar to what Gallup found, which is that Democrats are generally more likely than Republicans to support most of these things, but that doesn't mean that Republicans are totally opposed to it. We had um, majority support uh, among Republicans for um, proposals like requiring officers to live in the places where they work uh, and creating a federal government database to track officers who are accused of misconduct. So um, while there are partisan differences, there's still a lot of support for these proposals. That obviously doesn't mean the proposals will become law on Capitol Hill. Um, just because the public supports something doesn't translate into, into passing a bill necessarily. Um, but it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thing to observe that there is bipartisan support for a lot of this. Uh, and then getting on to the, uh, the defunding the police question, um, Gallup asked that question in a, in a different way than, than we did. Um, and I'm glad they did because it gives us um, some more insight onto it. Um, the whole idea of defunding the police, as uh, you guys both know, and as I'm sure many people on the call know, yeah, is, a little, is a little challenging to get at in a survey because of these different ideas of what defund actually means. You have people um, who think defund means zeroing out funding, no more funding, abolishing, uh, and then others who think of it as a reduction in funding, and then others who think of it as take some funding away and devote it elsewhere, like to mental health services. Uh, so the way that we asked about it in our June survey was to give people um, five options, basically. We asked, do you think that, uh, would, you, would you prefer for policing uh, in your area to uh, be decreased a little, be decreased a lot? Uh, stay about the same, be increased uh, a little, or be increased a lot. And the, the largest share of Americans, 42%, said that they wanted policing, uh, police funding in their area to stay about the same. And only about one in 10 actually said that they preferred for um, police funding to be decreased a lot. Um, so that didn't show a lot of support for the, for at least one idea of what defunding is. Um, but I would just you know, take pains to point out that there are different ways of asking about this question. And as you can tell from what Steve said, um, he, their, their survey included an option uh, about, about devoting some of that money to other things and, and that uh, drew considerably more. The, um, what, um, do we have any sense on any of these questions? And I understand we might not because of how relatively new some of the terminology is around this conversation, but do we have any sense on any number of these things if there's a trend line over time as it relates to, even if it's kind of broad and aggregate, right? Are, are people now more supportive of more seemingly radical or, or bigger types of shifts and proposals than they were a few years ago? Has that stayed around the, you know, what can we say over time, if anything at all? Um, John may be better able to address that than me. Unfortunately, most of the questions that we've asked about specific reform proposals, we, we asked for the first time this year. Uh, so we actually don't have trends um, on a lot of that. But we do know that Americans' perceptions of race relations 
uh, took a big tumble after uh, 2014. Um, so, you know, uh, my impression is that, you know, the appetite for uh, reforms that improve relations, I'm sure has gone up since then, but uh, I don't have trends on specific proposals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same thing for us. We, a lot of these questions we asked for the first time, I mean, defund the police wasn't something that was getting a lot of national attention um, until this year. Uh, we do have trends on, on views toward policing as a whole, which I think we, we looked at earlier, and definitely views of police on these um, issues related to racial equality and using force have gotten more negative. But in terms of actual specific policy proposals, we haven't, um, we haven't been able to trend back very far on those. And I'm sure we both, both organizations probably will moving forward. <laughs> yeah, sure. no, 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 of course. And, and I get that. I mean, that makes sense. Right? This is a conversation that has evolved relatively quickly in terms of the language being used, the proposals on the table. Have, have we seen any, I mean, we talked about this a little bit at, up front, you know, but has there been a, or can we expand a little bit on how in some ways there's been a, polarization in both directions around beliefs? Is that something that we think is, you know, we've certainly seen increases in support for some of these policies and perception of race relations, but what is the other side of that coin? Um, you know, are there folks who are now more inclined to support law enforcement or to believe that these, um, it, that, that calls for reform are unnecessary to be more supportive of police unions than they were previously? What do we know about the people making up these percentages and what shifts might be happening in those numbers? Um, well, I, I think first of all, it's important to reiterate the partisan divide because it really does overwhelm everything else, right? So there are a lot of significant differences between racial groups on these issues, but they, they are nowhere near as large as the partisan it splits, right? So um, even among Republicans, um, you know, there is some variation between white and black Republicans, um, but that doesn't, uh, that pales in comparison to the differences between Republicans and Democrats overall, right? So, um, so that's one thing to, to say. Um, we, we ask a question about um, Americans' views of the, the need for change in policing, whether they feel like major changes are necessary, minor changes, or no changes are needed. And just, again, to, to yeah, there you go. Again, to, um, to, to look at the partisan split, 89% uh, of Democrats say major changes are needed, 14% of Republicans. So it's, hard, it's really hard to get away from this partisan gap whenever you talk about this, this issue at all. But we do see, you know, as I said, um, also a significant difference uh, between racial groups here with 88% of Black Americans and 51% of white Americans say major change is needed. But the, the, the key is that among white Americans, there's a huge split between Republicans and Democrats, right? So 88% uh, of white Democrats say major changes are needed versus 13% of white Republicans. So yeah, it, 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 a lot of it just comes back to that, that um, political split, which is really intensified this year, you know, partly because it's an election year, but, but that polarization has been building for, you know, for decades now. So I also did want to point out, um, and John alluded to this earlier, but there are there are really large uh, age-based gaps in support. I was just about to ask about that because yeah. that's really um, interesting as well. So 81% of 18 to 34 year olds say major changes are needed. And I looked at the partisan split among that too. And um, among Republicans under age 35, 36% uh, say major changes are needed versus 12% of those over age 35. So among well, all three times as much? Three times as much, yeah, among the among the under 35 group. So among all groups, um, there is a significant age split with much higher support for reform among younger Americans. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's really interesting. Go, go ahead, John. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say same thing in our surveys. Um, the, the groups, I think I mentioned earlier, there's not a whole lot of support for defunding the police in the way that we asked that question, but the highest support was among young people. Young, young people was, were much more likely to support that than older people. People under 50, much more likely to support it than people over 50. Uh, and then I would just echo again what Steve said in terms of um, changes over time. Um, 
the, the questions that we asked in 2016, four years ago, uh, about various elements of police performance, um, using the right amount of force, treating racial and, a group, uh, racial and ethnic groups equally, attitudes have become more negative uh, across the board. That's true among both Republicans and Democrats. But what we've seen is that Democrats have become more negative more quickly than Republicans. And so the effect of that is that the partisan gap only grows wider. So even though they're moving in the same direction, the gap is getting bigger. So um, you have Democrats much more critical than Republicans of police, of many different aspects of policing, and that, that gap has just grown. Do, do we have a sense, this occurs to me, and, and you guys might not have this offhand, but do we have a sense of how that partisan divide uh, correlates with population, right? That sometimes when we look at this, this polling, it's tempting to think, well, the poll itself might be controlled to look at the similar chunks of people, that there are not necessarily the same number of Democrats in the country as there are Republicans, right? And so there's a world in which if a supermajority of Democrats support something, but a supermajority of Republicans don't support it, that could still represent a lot of support or, or, or a majority support in the country, because my impression is that there are more Democrats in raw number than there are Republicans. Is that a fair? Uh, John, you want to take that? Broad. Sure, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, our, all the surveys that, that Gallup and Pew both do are, are weighted towards uh, partisanship. Um, and so it, it already accounts for the fact that there are more people who call themselves Democrats. So that's, that's kind of baked into the cake already. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. But there are also people, a lot of people often misunderstand. Right. There are also a large segment, and especially among young people, that call themselves political independents, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, opinions among independents can swing either toward Republicans or Democrats, depending on the question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in some of these uh, uh, social justice questions, they, they more closely identify with Democrats, I think, because independents tend to be younger um, in, in a lot of cases than uh, Republicans or Democrats. But that's not necessarily the case. On other questions, they do, um, you know, they do appear to uh, fall closer to Republicans. It just depends on what you ask. Sure. Uh, but, and that helps explain why in some of these cases, we see almost no support among Republicans, very high amount of support among Democrats. And then when it ends up all in the same pot overall, there ends up, it ends up leaning towards the Democratic position because there are more Democrats in both the sample and in the population. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want I, I to pivot uh, to the politics of this, um, but I want to remind folks that we are taking uh, questions. They're, they're queuing up in the, uh, the Q&A thing. And so very quickly, I'm going to shut up and, and leave them to your guys' questions, which are much better than mine. And so I want to remind you, uh, feel free to submit them in there. We're going to get to them in just a moment. And so we're reading them, we're looking at them. Um, and so load that queue up with questions and, and we'll start knocking those out in a second. You know, Steve, you alluded to this year being an election year um, and the politics of all of this. How do these questions correlate with our electoral politics? How might these questions factor into things like the presidential race we're seeing or to be it Senate races or other, I mean, when we have an election, it's not just one, one race, we've got all types of elections happening. What should we know or what can the data tell us about um, how these issues of law enforcement relate to our understanding of our, our national politics? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think, the fundamental insight is that um, politics has become so much more polarized in the last 10 years, and certain issues have driven that polarization, right? And so issues of law and order uh, and social justice are key among those. And um, over the past 10 years, you know, we've seen a lot of divergence between Republicans and Democrats in terms of, um, you know, any type of question related to those issues with Democrats hewing much more closely to uh, social concern with social justice and Republicans more to um, concern with law and order. You know, partly it's, um, you know, we, we've sorted almost into different communities in terms of, you know, people that we identify with politically and Republicans are m more likely to be, set be found in rural areas than Democrats. So part of it is that geographic uh, separation, but, um, yeah, this this issue in particular, and, and COVID is is sort of the over overarching issue for the election, I think. 
But this, this uh, criminal justice reform issue is one of the key uh, differentiators between the two parties, and so it will have an effect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would say that what we know from our polling is that the public this year is, is very clearly engaged with these issues. Um, we see this in a number of different ways, and there are very clear signals about that. Um, in the poll that, we've been, that we released yesterday, actually, 78% um, of Americans said that they've been paying attention to issues of racial inequality in recent months. Um, back in September, we asked uh, people about a variety of news stories that were in the news at the time, big news stories. And the one that came out on top, uh, pretty far above um, all of the others, uh, said by 84% of Americans that they were paying a lot of attention to it, were clashes between law enforcement and protesters in some cities around the country. Mm -hmm. um, we also know from surveys in September that more than half of Americans support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that's down from two thirds in June, right when that, um, uh, right when the uh, killing of George Floyd took place. But it's still a substantial figure. Um, so we know that these issues are really resonating with people. We found that a, a pretty sizable uh, share of Americans have actually personally participated in some of the protests that have happened this year. Um, but I would caveat everything that I said um, by by taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Um, on, on the issues that voters are telling us nationally are going to be important for them uh, when they think about voting. And so we haven't asked about policing um, exactly, but we have asked about um, the related issues of violent crime and inequality, racial and ethnic inequality. So um, I have a slide that is, okay, there it is. Um, and basically what you can see is that these issues are in the middle of the pack for voters, for registered voters. It's not as important uh, as the economy or healthcare, but it's more important than things like climate change or abortion. Uh, this survey was conducted in the summertime, so it was before the death of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, so it's possible that Supreme Court appointments and the issue of abortion and court-related issues may have, may have increased since then, but um, this is what we found at the time. Uh, and then the other thing that you'll notice from, um, from the chart you're looking at is that unlike some of the other issues we asked about, um, particularly the economy and Supreme Court appointments and foreign policy, these issues aren't especially bipartisan in terms of, uh, in terms of what people are, um, if people see them as important to their vote. You can see that the um, Republicans in our survey, the, uh, the Republican registered voters are much more likely to say violent crime is a big issue uh, for their vote. And by contrast, racial and ethnic inequality, Democrats are much more likely to see that as important. And of course, these two issues are um, often intertwined, but yeah, you can see that Republicans are looking at it from the crime side and Democrats are looking at it from the inequality side. That, that's really that's really interesting. Do we know anything about how this how this prioritization and urgency changes among demographic groups, be it age or race or anything like that? Um, in general, with these issues, um, you can you can uh, view registered voters in the two parties kind of as stand-ins for for their demographic groups. Often, a lot of the time, so we know that the Democratic coalition is is more likely to skew um, toward uh, racial and ethnic minority groups, and the uh, the Republican coalition is more dominated by white voters. And so, um, it's not an exact one-to-one -one match, of course, but uh, there's an awful lot of overlap. Certainly. What else, you know, what haven't I talked, <laughs> asked you guys about that you think jumps out from the data? I mean, you guys both have some real expertise and this has been fascinating to watch in real time, how some of these conversations have shifted and molded and moved. Obviously public, public opinion is not a static thing. The news itself helps change and move it. And, that the, and, it, and there can be, uh, it, it can oscillate in different directions you know, on the Black Lives Matter question right after George Floyd, you're up to almost two thirds of Americans saying they support the Black Lives Matter movement. Now you're down to back down to around half of Americans, still an increase, but you see that kind of back and forth given the news events. What else should people know to help contextualize what they're seeing, to understand what they're seeing? And we have a lot of, I think, law enforcement practitioners on the call, people who study, people who research, people who themselves are in law enforcement or used to be. What, what might it make sense for them to take away from these numbers um, in terms of how they think about these questions? Um, you know, one thing I would mention is um, that we do, uh, Gallup does a separate study uh, of Americans living in what we call fragile communities, which are, which are communities with um, areas of concentrated poverty. So they have 
high poverty rates, low, uh, low rates of post-secondary education, um, we have a couple of other criteria that we use, but, it, but basically they lack access to opportunity. And we select census tracts that meet those criteria, and then we just survey people in those census tracts. And um, that's, that uh, research is pretty fascinating um, because it focuses on people who are in areas that you know, typically have high crime rates. They, they more often you know, possibly interact with police. Um, they have higher uh, minority populations. So, um, and one of, the, one of the questions that we ask, and I've talked with law enforcement uh, professionals about this, and, and they're always kind of surprised, is would you rather police spend more time, the same amount of time, or less time than they currently spend in your area? And among all of these fragile community residents, 51% uh, say more time, and 6% say less time. So there's a lot of concern about, you know, control of crime and, you know, people craving stability in areas where they're really trying to pursue opportunities. But what's really surprising is that among black residents, 52% uh, say they would like the police to spend more time in their area versus 46% for white residents. So black residents in fragile communities are even more likely than white residents to say they would like more police presence in their areas uh, rather than less. Um, which is counterintuitive to a lot of law enforcement professionals I talk to who say, you know, African Americans in their communities are, are angry about injustice. And we do see a lot of differences in the, uh, the social justice questions we ask in these surveys. Um, but they also have a lot of concern that, you know, um, uh, conditions in their neighborhoods are unstable, right? And uh, that they need access to, they need to be able to uh, pursue educational opportunities. They need to be able to pursue job opportunities and feel safe in doing so. So, um, so that's um, that's one thing from our, our fragile communities research that I think is important to keep in mind in light of, you know, um, calls to defund the police. Those have to be balanced against the need, the concern for security. Steve, do you, do you think it's fair to, based on that, which I think I'm really glad you went into that, um, and I think one or two people have asked specific questions like that in the in the uh, Q and A. Um, is it fair to extrapolate from that as well as the other polling numbers we have seen, right? That black Americans want police who treat them fairly, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that what, they're, what they're saying is, you know, that people who live in neighborhoods who are not, who, who do not feel safe or who might fall victim to crime or live, or live in poverty, yeah. um, are concerned about public safety and want to live in communities that are safe and also do not want to be subject to violations of their civil rights, do not want, you know, believe that the police they have currently are tr mistreating them, but that doesn't mean they want to get rid of all policing because they understand there might be a role for police. In yeah. Yeah. I think there's a real craving for positive relations with the police in these communities. Um, and the, the sense of security that people get when they see law enforcement officers around occasionally, when they feel free to interact with them in a positive manner um, and have that sense of assurance that things are under control in their neighborhoods, right? And that, um, you know, that that's really the only way to get to a place where you can start to build a better life for yourself by having that sense of security. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I would uh, just add on this um, general point is that um, a lot of the times in discussions about policing or public views of policing, the, the attitudes of the police officers themselves are, are overlooked, and um, we don't have any recent data on it, but we did do a uh, representative survey of U.S. police officers who serve in departments of at least 100, so relatively large police departments. Um, back in 2016, and um, the survey was fascinating. It found a lot of different, um, very nuanced things about the views of police, but one that stands out to me and which I think is always worth remembering um, in discussions like these is that the views of the police are not a monolith either. Um, and we know that the views of black police officers and white police officers, for example, differ wildly, and in some cases, cases even more than the general public's views do. Mm. Um, so for example, in that survey, we asked about whether these confrontations between the police and, and, uh, and, and black people in society were signs of a larger problem or whether they were um, one-off incidents and black, black police officers were far more likely than white police officers to, they were, to say that they were signs of a larger problem. And we also found that black police officers generally view uh, racial progress in the United States far less positively than white police officers. So um, 
it's a, it's a four year old survey and we don't know what's happened to views since then, but I think it's probably still the case that we can't uh, consider police views to be just one, you know, one monolith. They, uh, they differ just as much as, as other people do. Yeah, that was a really, I, I remember writing about that survey at the time and I, and I just think it was a remarkably impressive and important conversation, right? Because, e because very often when we have the public conversation, we pit the views of the police versus the views of the, po but the diversity of opinion, even within police officers and the difference between what your average white police officer believes about these issues and what their black and brown colleagues believe, I, I think was a very interesting gulf and gap there. Um, that a lot of uh, police officers of color supported uh, many things that some of their white colleagues didn't and, and vice versa. Yep, absolutely. And that even went down to uh, policies. Um, we asked about things like body worn cameras and there were even you know, racial, racial differences among police and things like that, uh, where the black officers were more supported than the white officers. Hmm. That's really interesting. So with that, I'm gonna turn the microphone back over to Abby, who's gonna help walk through some of the questions you all have sent in, keep them coming. Um, there are a lot of great questions in there. Um, and like I said, I'm gonna try to fade in the background a little bit so that John and Steve can keep answering. Cause I just think this data is really important. It's really interesting. It really grounds us in an understanding of where things stand right now. And so if you've got questions you wanna ask, please keep them coming in that Q and A chat box. And Abby, the floor is yours again. And Wesley, don't go fading too far in the t into the background. All of your work on this over the past few years, you, have, you bring a very valuable perspective. And thanks to everyone who's been submitting questions. We have so many. We're going to do our best to get to as many as possible today. Um, and with that, I might be condensing some down. So John, you actually just hit on a theme in the questions, which is that law enforcement face an incredibly complicated job and they are also pretty limited in their ability to communicate openly with the public and while that can obviously impact transparency it also impacts public understanding of the challenges that they face so you mentioned that uh, law enforcement officers were surveyed a number of years ago are there plans to go back and resurvey them soon and see if there's been a shift in perception amongst officers uh, I would love to do that. I'm not sure that we have any plans to do it. It was a, it was a big and very complicated survey um, for a number of reasons. Um, uh, I don't think that we are planning to do that anytime soon. Um, but I think that um, given the, the circumstances that the 2016 survey happened under and the things that were happening in the country at the time, um, you know, I don't want to make any guarantees, but I think that it's still probably pretty relevant today and how the police view some of these same issues. Um, and in terms of, um, getting the views of the police out there, I would just um, go back to one of the findings from that survey, which is that um, the public, we asked, we asked the same questions at the time to the police and the public. And uh, one thing that was really, that really jumped out was that the public by and large felt that they understood police work to a, to a reasonable degree. They understood the risks, the challenges of it. The police overwhelmingly said the public does not understand that at all. They, that they do not appreciate um, the, some of the challenges that the police have on that front. Uh, and we also found that the police view uh, the media in particular pretty skeptically. Um, they, they were not, uh, they did not have a great deal of confidence in the media and the media coverage of some of these incidents. So um, to, the, to the extent that the uh, questioner asked about, you know, the police views being known, um, we, we did learn some really interesting things from that program. Thanks so much, John. Steve, this next question is for you. Another theme in our questions today is how well represented people who live in communities that are experiencing high rates of violence, that are traditionally over-policed, that, um, that have experienced high profile events. You talked about the work that you've done looking at fragile communities. Can you speak to how well represented uh, these communities and these perceptions may be in the national numbers we talked about today? Um, yeah, they're, they're, um, they're not too far off from the national numbers, um, but there are some significant differences. Um, we, the, the stat that I mentioned a little bit earlier about police spending more time in your area, there's actually much less concern that police do that in, in um, communities that aren't fragile communities. So um, people in fragile communities are much more likely to say they'd like to see a greater police presence. However, the, the racial divides in terms of questions like, do you know a lot of people who were treated unfairly by police? Do you know a lot of people who were unfairly sent to jail? Um, the, the gaps between um, 
white residents of fragile communities and black residents of fragile communities are actually larger than we see among the total population. And especially with regard to white, you know, black versus white rather, rather than Hispanic versus white. Um, and I think that's in part a reflection of, you know, the, the problem of mass incarceration in fragile community, uh, in, uh, you know, particularly in black fragile communities. Um, and, uh, you know, that disrupts a lot of people's lives. We see that, you know, uh, reflected in the data. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that overall in a lot of questions, the results are similar, but in certain questions like that, the differences are amplified in fragile communities. Thanks so much. We had an interesting question come in from Kevin Morrison, one of our viewers. They asked, is there any sense that the public feels about the police much the same way they do about Congress? That is, do they like their local police agency but distrust the profession as a whole? Has any of either of your work gotten at that question? Uh, I guess I can handle this one um, just uh, in, in the sense that I, I kind of addressed it earlier a little bit in the sense that there is a difference between asking a question generally and specifically. And we see this, I, I love the example of, the, of Congress because that's a, a perfect example. Nobody likes Congress when it's asked about Congress in the abstract, but ask about a particular local congressman and people are much more positive. Um, and so in our, in our surveys about police, the police do pretty well when you ask in a general comparative way, police versus college professors or uh, scientists or other groups of people, but you can see that when you drill down into some of the specifics, the views are much more um, negative. Uh, I don't have an answer in terms of geogra uh, geography. We haven't uh, broken these um, samples down by anything beyond just overall region, and region is a huge geographic unit that doesn't tell you very much. Um, so we, we don't have a sample size to be able to ask people, you know, what do you think about the Los Angeles Police Department or the Dallas Police Department? Um, but I would just say that um, how you ask the question matters, and there's definitely differences when you move from the more general to the more Thanks so much, John. So another question that we received from Bernard Malekian, one of our viewers, is that both of your polling reports seem to show a dramatic shift in a relatively short period of time. Can you recall a similar issue that generated such a shift? And if so, did the demand for change sustain itself or did that fade over time? Um, for me, the one that comes to mind is 9-11, <laughs> which um, everything, there are certain events that happen uh, and it drives me crazy as an analyst because all of the data collected prior to that event are now irrelevant, right? <laughs> because the mindset has, mindset has shifted so much. So after 9-11, support for the US government went up among all groups, way, way up. George W. Bush's approval rating went up. Um, it created a, a kind of rally effect among all Americans where there was less divisiveness. Um, you know, a very rare uh, period where um, you know, there was, there was more uh, connection between Republicans and Democrats in terms of support for various you know, government proposals, et cetera. But that, that dissipates, right? So as the shock of the event wears off, um, you know, uh, things kind of go back to normal. And the, the prevailing trend over the last 20 years has been toward greater polarization. Um, I don't know what, that that will happen in uh, you know, the, the um, Black Lives Matter movement in particular seems to have created a mind shift after Ferguson, after uh, you know, George Floyd this year. I think um, after Ferguson and, and that movement became uh, more, you know, rose to national prominence, it set the tone for a lot of negative reaction to the George Floyd event. Um, and now you know, Black Lives Matter has been back in, in the spotlight this year. We may see a more sustained uh, change in public opinion uh, you know, so far, uh, Americans' opinions of race relations have not rebounded since the 2014, you know, events in Ferguson. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it does seem to be a lasting effect up to this point. Uh, two issues. Two issues we've seen that where public opinion has changed very quickly in a big in a big way: um, gay marriage and marijuana legalization. Yeah. Um, we did a, 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 a kind of a, a publication at the end of 2019, summing up the decade, and it kind of showed this X in public opinion, where gay marriage support for gay marriage was a mi minority opinion, and you know, 10 years later, it's very much a majority opinion. And same with um, marijuana legalization. What, what about, um, just to kind of build out a little bit more some of these other issues, because I was going to ask about 
gay marriage specifically marijuana legalization is really interesting what about things like climate change or even i don't even know how you guys would have answered this question but we we hear a lot about like the perception of words like socialism or how capital or economic inequality right other issues that in recent years certainly the public conversation has shifted how how does the policing conversation relate to some of those other ones as well Um, you know, I keep coming back to this. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but um, the, 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 common, the commonality between those things is that uh, polarization has increased dramatically by, you know, along political lines. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to underestimate that effect right now. And it, it, you know, to me, it creates almost a dangerous situation in that you have a lot of potential for social conflict. And you have lack of potential for collective action on some of these huge issues like climate change, um, you know, like race relations, because we're, you know, the two sides are, are busy fighting with, with one another. So to me, you know, while overall support for, a client, you know, uh, uh, ways to address climate change haven't changed very much, you know, the divergence between Republicans and Democrats has been startling. Yeah, I would, I would say with, with climate change, um, I think maybe the policing discussion is similar to that. Um, climate change, you see, um, you see a growing share of Americans who say it's a major problem, major concern. Um, but then you look under the hood and you find that almost all of that is driven by Democrats and not Republicans. So um, it could end up being that the policing, you know, policing reform discussion is something similar to that. So I want to close with a question that does get at this political divide. And um, I will warn that it strays a bit beyond just the data. So we'll be looking for your, a bit of your interpretation here. Uh, but there's clear documentation that there is a partisan divide and a stark partisan divide on policing. But why? Uh, do we have any reason uh, or do we have anything that can help us understand what explains why Republicans and Democrats see these issues so differently right now? Um, I, I can address that a little bit. Um, I, there's a book by um, a, a psychologist, sociologist named Jonathan Haidt uh, called uh, Righteous Minds, and it talks about how uh, values have, have become to be very different between the Republican perspective and the Democratic perspective, and um, how, you know, the, these di this divergence has been growing over time, but, you know, Republican values tend to adhere much more to uh, things like, you know, stability, security, um, you know, law and order, um, and democratic values, you know, skew more towards, you know, social justice, fairness, those types of issues. And um, as the two parties have polarized, part of the reason for that polarization is this values divergence. So I think that's part of what you see, see there is that, um, you know, um, Republicans are more likely to uh, approve of the police because they're there to enforce law and order. Uh, Democrats more likely to disapprove when they hear about uh, police misconduct because it violates their strong sense of social justice. And I would just add that um, you can never underestimate the role of elected officials in moving public opinion themselves with the signals that they're sending to their constituency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all these issues uh, that weren't necessarily partisan all that long ago are now becoming partisan. And a lot of the time that's because of the fact that um, elected officials may choose to, to highlight differences between them and the other party. And, and that is a strong signal to their voters uh, uh, you know, on, on how they might think about those issues. And you see that on all sorts of different fronts. Um, and criminal justice is just, is, is, is one of them, but by far, you know, definitely not the only one. Thank you so much. And we're coming up on the end of our time here. Wesley, I want to come back to you for a moment after moderating this discussion and hearing more about how these public opinion polls are, are resulting. Uh, do you have any closing comments or closing takeaways? Sure. I mean, I think that I think that in every time I look at these polls and spend time in them and have the opportunity to talk to people like John or Steve, you know, one of the things that really jumps out to me is the complexities of these issues. And I and, and what I mean by that is I think that very often our public conversation and our and even our media conversation, media coverage, misses the depth um, of this and misses it in a lot of different directions, right? And so um, we'll hear, for example, 
about how, well, no, the majority of Americans don't, uh, you know, don't uh, support abolishing the police. But then you see the majority of Americans support uh, not having the police involved in any nonviolent crime. Well, that would be a remarkable change in the way American policing works. And I don't know that a lot of policing leaders have grappled with the extent to which a fair amount of Americans support pretty significant changes to the way policing is done and vice versa, right? We also hear, you know, well, the majority of, the bl of, of black Americans will either want more police or they want, but then the complexities and the nuances where they also say they feel more likely that they themselves have had bad experiences with the police and they prioritize racial injustice. And so in a lot of these cases, there aren't simple answers and simple narratives um, that there's complexity, there's nuance, there's gray area. And, and I think that, I mean, I think those of us in the media have a responsibility to try to uh, grapple with that um, and, and explain those things. And I think that anyone in this space having these conversations, it would behoove them to sit in those complications and those nuances. What, what I also think is interesting, and it's not just on this issue, as Steve noted and John noted, this is true on any number of issues. You know, we are facing a moment in the country where you do have majority support for a lot of things for which there is not legal mechanism to make the change happen. And I think that is going to be, the, and that's very interesting in a broad societal um, way, right? When you have majority and in some cases, super majority of support for big changes. And yet because of the way our governmental system works, those changes aren't enacted. Uh, right. That seems to be the type of thing that leads to unrest, distrust, polarization, right? You think the system doesn't work, you, but you have no means of changing it. Um, and so I think that that is just an interesting dynamic to be thinking about for all of us and how that might spur um, some of the things we see playing out and what that might look like in the future if some of that isn't redressed in whatever way that happens and on whatever issue that, you know, that applies to. Well, Wesley, Steve, John, I want to thank you on behalf of the council for joining us today for this discussion. It's been incredibly interesting for us and clearly from the Q&A for our viewers as well. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. This session will be available on our website, councilonCJ.org shortly, and we hope to see you back for our next webinar soon. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you for having us.